Hello everyone, welcome to this episode of The Future State. We're super excited about this one because we've got a great guest on with us today. So Beth is here with us. Um, Beth runs an agency called Built by Content. And Beth, great, great to have you here today. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me on. Very honoured to be here. One of my favourite podcasts. I'm not just saying that because I'm on here. <laughs> and yeah, so I run Built by Content, which is a micro agency, and I work predominantly with uh, tech startups. So usually those in the SaaS space, software as a service and helping them, as the name suggests, to sort of grow by content. So I realized early on when I was more of a sort of general digital marketer that content is usually a very good way to achieve growth if you've not got a lot of budget and, you, and particularly if you need fast growth. Um, so that's what I help startups to do today, usually from sort of product market fit stage up to series A, sometimes series B funding. And that usually falls into two things. So uh, more technical sort of SEO, less glamorous content, and then also brand content. So sort of founder fame, thought leadership, podcasts, videos, the more sort of exciting branded content. So, um, we, we hear all these cliches and they're some of my favorite sayings, obviously, as we go about our business in the world today with social media and everything else, you know, content is king. Every business is now a content business. Um, so it's going to be super interesting today to delve into that with you and start finding out a little bit more about where, where content's heading. Um, and also, yeah, where, where it's going to head sort of medium term as well, because I think every business now is so conscious of their content and how they can, um, create content easily, obviously put that out across their own channels, amplify that content. And as you said, you know, it can be so important for positioning of a company for driving inbound leads um so yeah really really interesting chat i think we'll have today to find out a little bit more danny do you want to kick us off with some questions yeah beth and i have known each other for quite a while and i was lucky enough to be on one of beth's podcasts so beth and i are old friends but um I'd, something that beth does uniquely which a lot of content um agencies don't do is is creates a huge amounts of content so Beth has newsletters, she's had a podcast or has a podcast and um, puts out so much valuable content via Instagram, etc. So one of the things I was going to ask Beth is why content and pairing strategy is, is so difficult for people and why do people struggle with, with content? Yeah, I mean, I think what you've hit on there is it is a challenge for just about everybody from, you know, startups to two bigger brands. And I, th I think there's probably a few reasons. I think a lot of the time actually content ideas and creative actually comes top down. So we've all worked for a boss or a founder who says, you know, we should be on TikTok or I've just seen this clubhouse thing. And, and while that's very exciting, the marketing team or the, the agency sort of jumps on that trend and comes up with this creative content. Um, and a lot of the time, yes, okay, maybe that leads to vanity metrics. And if I'm honest, I think a lot of, um, founders and, and even some high level marketing people actually are very impressed by vanity, vanity metrics. So impressed by reach and impressions, but then at the same time, they will ask, why isn't the company growing? Why aren't we making more sales? Why aren't we getting leads? And they don't seem to realize that there's such a gulf between creative ideas and strategy. And, and then on the other side, I mean, if, if you take SEO as one example, so companies will say, you know, we need to do SEO because we want to be found on Google and we want direct sales and leads, but then they'll hire maybe an ex journalist as a content writer and, and, you know, journalists are fantastic writers but the, their writing style is a lot around sort of thought leadership and it's quite creative and it's quite editorial and it won't be written to answer questions in Google. It won't follow SEO best practices. And then they'll ask, well, why isn't this content ranking? Why aren't I on page one? So I think being able to have a strategy and a purpose and then follow that through the whole way through execution and also measurement and knowing what that is, I think that's where a lot of, a lot of companies fall down. And there's some really interesting points that you said there. I think um, a lot of people w have probably come across that kind of boardroom scenario or top-down scenario where someone's been out for lunch with someone or there's been a board meeting and there's a new buzzword in town. 
Um, obviously, I'm pushing buzzwords quite heavily at the moment with the metaverse and me being in VR, but um, <laughs> it's another one of those buzzwords. And and uh, and we've all, we've all been there. I remember there was a story actually from a previous company. I'll name no names, um, but one of um, our CEO at the time came back and he just heard the term growth hacking. And um, I was I was a CMO there at, at the time, and um, he was like, "We we got to do some growth hacking. We need a growth hacker. How do we find one?" And it was like, you, "You've just heard this word. You clearly don't understand what it is or how to go like what the strategy is that lies behind it." And uh, that became you know the buzzword of the month, and it was all about how do we kind of, <laughs> kind of deal with that. And I th I think this is probably what people come across quite a lot is that they get this top down. The buzzword appears that the new direction of travel is being spoken about. Why aren't we doing this? Or I spoke to someone about this and da, da, da. What do you think is an effective technique for managing these situations within within a business context? If, if, if someone comes in, they've heard about the latest thing, there's no real strategy behind it. You've got to appease maybe a top-down approach in a, and senior leadership. Um, how do you best go about dealing with that and, and maybe appeasing it and, you know, giving it its dues, but at the same time, educating maybe upwards um, what the company should be doing in relation to that? Yeah, I mean, it's super difficult. And, and I'd say I'm a lot better at it now than I was probably in the early days of my career. Um, I, I think also if, if you're working with a company that's very clear on their sort of brand purpose and their brand mission, it will always be easier because rather than saying we need to be on TikTok, what should we do on TikTok? You sort of say, what is our brand mission? okay, what is the TikTok landscape like? And then a bit like a sort of Venn diagram, what's the bit in the middle and, and does that apply? Um, but what I find is I, I've, the whole way through the project, I'll sort of be pu pushing back on, you know, leadership. Okay, what is the aim here? Why do you want to do that? Does that map back to the overall company goals? If not, you know, let, let's keep it parked. And don't get me wrong, sometimes you just have to appease the, the people you're working for. And if they want to test a channel, then, you know, maybe you need to put a bit of a small part of resource into that channel just to sort of keep them happy. But I think reiterating what are the expectations here? It's not, you know, it's not the fun bit. It's not the glamorous bit, but someone has to do it. And, and I will continually do that throughout all of my projects. I always call it, you have to have a, uh, like a content adult in the room. It's like, otherwise, if you let kids watch TV or you let like a man who's hung over watch TV, it'd be the same thing they've always watched, or it'd be something that's new and shiny and I'll turn it off pretty quickly. So I think often you have to be the content adult that says, Hey, it's, you know, it was great last time or Hey, it's nice and shiny, but you probably won't love it. Or it's going to take X amount of budget. It was going to take Y amount of time. And I've seen it happen numerous times. And even uh, more recently speaking to a company, they create phenomenal amounts of content. They just don't know how to get it out there and get people to watch it and why it's important. And we're just inundated through feeds. So like our, our content habits and consumption habits. Now, that's why I call it a must read to my newsletter. A content diet is you have to cut through all the noise now because it's too much content to to discover. So I wonder, I wonder how you think about like the creation side of it, Beth, like, do you think it's, uh, it has to be all creation or do you think there's like some curation that needs to happen? Do, do you think there's like a perfect blend for people to have a rule of thumb? I know it's the worst thing to ask you, but do you think there is a, like a, a magic formula someone could, could leave today and feel happy with it? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a difficult one to say. I, I think personally, creation is the easy bit. We, we can all come up with ideas, right? I can go on a dog walk and have 10 ideas, but the people who actually execute those ideas, they're the ones that you want to hire um, because it is the execution that actually leads to results. And I think, um, I think we're all pretty bad actually at repurposing our content. I think that's a, a gap that content marketers haven't really worked out how to solve yet. So, you know, if we spend a month filming video, which is quite labor intensive, there's a lot involved in it. 
then we might post it out once or twice and expect that expect it to get traction and as, as you've said the feeds are saturated attention spans are smaller it's really difficult to, to get content out there um and again to go you know viral again every leader i want to go viral it's sort of near on impossible really unless you're sort of controversial and, and in some ways you definitely don't want to go viral down that route so i think actually you know have have a great idea but spend a lot longer thinking about how will we execute this how will we distribute it what what are those loops going to look like of how we get it out there and that might be putting budget behind it it might be trying to work with partnerships or people who can expand the reach of your content and and that's a lot to put into one piece of content. So again, that comes back to that piece of content has to be the right piece of content at the right time, um, because otherwise so much effort goes into creation and then the execution is pretty poor. I, I just had, um, I, I think when you're at that kind of creation execution stage, I, I think there's a lot to consider. And as you said, mapping, mapping back to your goals and, and your overall strategy. But, you know, I've been in the situation a few times where, started a business early funding's pretty low um and it's basically what are we going to put our efforts into and i just wondered if you had a kind of a general kind of playbook of where to get started if we got some listeners out there that are early stage businesses they might not have um the budgets to create um video you know highly produced video they might be able to do some ugc stuff um, but I just wondered if you had a kind of playbook of like, where are the kind of five best content pillars to start just generally that are low cost, low barrier to entry and that can, can actually move the needle for, for early stage businesses? Yeah, sure. I mean, I would probably split it into sort of two categories if, if I was working with, with a new company, which often I am. And I would, def I mean, SEO, I don't, I don't want to bang the SEO drum because again, it, do it doesn't feel that glamorous, but SEO compounds over time. And that is why so many, particularly sort of B2B startups look into SEO because um, it's a strategy that, you know, you put six months worth of effort in, it's fairly low cost. As long as you've, as long as you sort of know your customers and you've got a pretty decent SEO writer, you can execute really quickly, especially, you know, with the website platforms out there at the moment, um, things like Webflow, you barely even need any development to have a really strong website that can rank easily. So behind the scenes, almost, I would be working on your sort of SEO strategy. Far too many companies come into that too late. And, you know, they've spent all their huge budget on ads and then realize that they've sort of hit a ceiling and then start to try and do SEO and don't really have the runway to be able to build that up before they need to, you know, raise funding. So I think something like that long term that compounds and, you know, if you're a B2C brand thinking even more about maybe social media as a long term strategy or social search, how can you be discoverable on some of the social media platforms where people are researching and buying products and, and shopping. And then I think also you do need um, to match that with sort of a content track that's a bit more creative. So I, I think people think they have to come up with, you know, a completely unique and, and brand new idea, but actually there's so much content within most companies already that um, can, can be really powerful. So my old company I used to work for, I used to have a call with the CEO used to ring me once a week when he, he was out walking his dog. And I just asked him questions, you know, what have you been talking to customers about? What's been coming up? What are your thoughts on this? You know, what are the trends you're seeing in the industry? And from that, I would get, you know, months worth of content. I'd, we'd have podcast ideas. We'd, I could um, create thought leadership content from him, PR quotes, um, social media. There was so much content just, just within his head because he had a bit of a mission. If you have people like that in your company, you know, there, there's content there that you can easily create and produce without really having any budget and that content's going to be really engaging for your audience just another sort of add on to what beth said is everyone in the business can be a content creator they just need to send bullet points to someone who can write or create like the everyone says technical people uh, aren't content creators it's absolute like lie because they have to write documentation for the code that they write so very often there'll be like a hidden gem like beth said on the ceo walk There'd be hidden gems within the tech team, the product team, the finance team. The finance team can probably give you one of the best pieces of content because of what their job is. And if there's a hack in the business, that would be brilliant for an audience. If there's um, a way that they can uh, collaborate with you more quickly and get 
invoice paid more quickly. They're like these brilliant hacks that, you know, will probably actually now go viral in some sort of uh, finance talk or like Excel talk, for instance. So these are all like great ways to hack, hack a system or, or get as many people content creating as possible. Yeah, and I think also that we really under um, value the, the power of education as, as content. So I work with a lot of, at the moment, especially a lot of companies in the sort of personal investment space, so new platforms or apps for different investment streams, and all of them are interested in, you know, education, whether that's a community, a forum, um, you know, a series of webinars, social media content and and really if you think about the upcoming generation so definitely um gen z but also millennials for them every moment is a moment to be optimized is a moment to be learning but it's, it's not like kind of the older generations which were happy to take leisure time just for the sake of leisure time they're all about self-improvement and so even when they're on social media they want to learn and i think the brands that tap into that and are providing educational content they're, they're the ones that, that will win. Um, and again, as, as you said, Danny, there's lots of people in the company that can help you to produce that. So even if you're a marketer or a content person and you don't have the education, it doesn't take much to translate what someone else tells you into really powerful content streams. Yeah, I have like EIE, which is uh, like a thing that I build around, which is educate, inspire and entertain. And I think that's the, the core pillars that people uh, should build around and educate is definitely the first one for me is, but people, that's how you, you nail search, like organic search or paid search with high intent is people are trying to be educated about something or try and get better or find a solution. So for me, that's the way that I've always tried to build around. And then if you can build anticipation now with video or video and audio, then I think that's the way to win. I think education is key, and I think it goes hand in hand with the nature of new businesses. So startups, for example, are generally disruptive, right? The reason most people do a, a new business or a startup is because they're, they're entering a market or they've seen a, an opportunity within a market that's not currently being serviced. Education is kind of crucial, and I think for new stage businesses that are disrupting a market, maybe their product or service offering is new to the, the sector. And I was just wondering, in terms of education, how do you make that educational content valuable, but also interesting and, and engaging? Because sometimes educational content, I think we're in a period now where people do want to learn. You know, podcasts are out there, there's so much information. We're reading blogs, we're reading LinkedIn posts, Medium. Like there's so much to kind of, uh, ways to kind of upskill. Um, but I was just wondering how you get traction around your educational content and if you're trying to maybe seed that content to an audience that you've not already acquired what are the best ways to kind of amplify that content and really make it impactful to to maybe win some customers or generate some inbound leads yeah i i think that probably comes down to thinking more about individual channels so obviously it's quite easy to do education from a seo perspective like danny said you're looking at intent you're answering that intent but yeah how does education translate over i mean how how to is still the most searched term on youtube but even um one thing that i think is really interesting about TikTok actually and I, I you know i'm not a huge TikTok fan um, but actually a lot of TikTok content, you know, yes, some of it is entertaining and we all like watching funny videos, but a lot of it is educational. Um, and there's, you know, there's a whole demographic on there, um, which is probably not the demographic you think of when you think of TikTok, but um, mothers and, you know, parents. And there's a whole section on TikTok of sort of hacks around parenthood. You know, how here's a video on how to fold a baby grow. Here's an activity you can do with your kid that doesn't make a mess and and that if you if you were a brand and that was your demographic there's an opportunity there to create content on TikTok and reach your reach your audience and you know have a really engaged following so actually i think it can be sort of sliced and diced in in many ways and it's just about understanding where that content is going and who your audience is and then actually you, you know you can be a bit more creative it doesn't have to be a seminar or you know something long-winded it can be cut down into really interesting bites of content that that people will engage with and they'll share crucially do you think that micro content is going to stick around for for a long time like TikTok, youtube shorts like these are all like traditionally under a minute content obviously TikTok are pushing into longer form 
But do you think like micro content is like here to stay for a while? Or do you do you think it will go back to to the written word or or spoken or vid or longer form? Do you think micro's here to stay for a while? Yeah, I think we've all become too obsessed with micro content. You know, there's a lot of content marketing stats that have come out over the past sort of five years. Attention spans six seconds. If you don't get someone's attention in the first two seconds, you've lost. And I think that's overinflated the the importance of micro content. I personally think micro content will stick around, particularly on social media, because we are just sort of scrolling through. But actually, I'm seeing a lot of brands returning to longer form content. Um, and I think the opportunity there is really powerful. So one type of content that B2B adopted a long time ago, and now I'm sort of seeing B2C adopt, is um, what I'd call a docu-series. So it's basically like a, doc a video documentary, um, you know, episodic content, four or five episodes. And uh, B2B companies were doing this. So they would start filming their CEO or one of their employees or an initiative that they're working on. They'd share that content on YouTube or even on their own website. It doesn't really matter which platform. And, you know, it's bingeable content and it's really intimate. And, and if somebody spends four hours watching your docu-series, that's a huge amount of time that they're spending with your brand you know, compared to the effort that might go into creating a series of TikToks, which someone might spend, you know, a minute watching. And, and yet the effort is, is still there. It still takes a lot of time to come up with that content to film it. Um, and I'm seeing more sort of B2C. So I think Paris Hilton has done a docu-series on YouTube recently following her sort of honeymoon in partnership with Hilton um, Hotel, see her family brand. And I think that's the format that people will start to adopt more, a bit like, you know, everyone's got a podcast. I think everyone will will start to think, how can we get people to spend more time with us? Because the, the effort for micro content just doesn't always weigh up with the results. It's quite hard to actually get leads or sales from that. That's where my head was going, because it, it, it's basically two types of content. We spoke about SEO earlier and we spoke about discoverable content. Obviously, the micro based content revolves around moments quite a lot, you know, and you're creating a moment, especially if you're putting it on um, like Instagram stories and it's disappearing like you see it momentarily and then it's gone. If if I'm a brand, where would you be encouraging me to, to spend my time? Like you said, effort and reward. And and if really one of my goals is, you know, either driving inbound leads or building a, a mailing list. You know, and I really want that to, to, to impact. But my head is I'm seeing all this content on Instagram stories all the time and we should be playing there and we should be doing stuff there. How do you get that balance right and how should you be analysing kind of where you spend your time and, and where do you get the Danny's favourite buzzword, bang for buck? <laughs> I like that. Um, yeah, it, it is really difficult, isn't it? But I think even, um, it, it, not to get too technical, but if we even think about data, there's a, there's a lot of talk in the marketing world at the moment about sort of first pay party data. Obviously, we've relied for a long time, especially of social media on sort of um, pixels and tracking and tags. And, and there's a lot of changes coming in to, to, or proposed changes to legislation and um, the way channels are able to access your data and, and supply personalized ads that actually it's it's going to be really difficult to access customers that way. So I think at, to, to your question, any type of owned content, whether that's a newsletter, whether that's a podcast, um, you know, even subscribers in, in some sort of way or, or people who are connecting with your brand regularly, you're, you're going to achieve far more reach um, being able to send out an, an email to people every week than you are on Instagram, because that's just not an owned community. Platform changes happen all the time. They affected a lot. A lot of people built Facebook pages and spent a ton of budget, you know, getting hundreds of thousands of followers. And then Facebook changed the whole way social media algorithms work. And all of a sudden that audience was lost. So I do think you always have to be thinking long term what your content strategy is, as well as supplementing with, you know, you, you have to be in the moment. You can't ignore that there's timely trends and, and particularly for obviously you have to be reaching new audiences. And if you're just emailing the same list all the time, how are you reaching new audiences? So I think it's a balance of the two, but I would certainly be saying to brands to be thinking long term, what is their sort of owned strategy of, of getting people to repeatedly interact with them? Something I love uh, is Seth Godin's uh, daily blog. I don't read it every day, but I know he does it. And uh, he's 
it can be 10, you know, 10 words, or it could be a thousand words. And he talks around it around his habit forming and it's a habit for him. And the, the cost of not doing it is way more than, than not, than actually doing it. And I wonder, um, if brands are going to have to adopt something similar is when they're creating content is like this, everyone's got a quality versus quantity battle, right? But I think there's going to be, uh, brands that are going to have, that are going to have to put out content all the time to be relevant in their market. And then I think there's going to be brands that are big enough that when they, when they do something, they'll, they'll pop. So I wonder if, if there'll ever be a, a true balance between quality and quantity, but it, it sort of shows you in the SEA world, you're always told to do quality and quantity, but quantity tends and refreshing content always tends to work. And on social media, people have, have dived on ephemeral content, you know, like stories that disappear. But stories don't don't grow like your account don't grow, doesn't really grow your engagement and I think over time there'll be there'll be a move where brands will choose very specific channels and they'll choose the cadence that they upload and they'll just know that it will build affinity to their brand and their products over time and it will be like you said Beth it's the it's the long term balance but I wonder if there'll be some brands that work out a formula like. Buzzfeed are famous for creating between 600 and a thousand pieces of content a day. And people laugh when you bring them up as a reference point, but they completely shifted how we, how we consumed content and they've been doing it for, for over a decade now. So I think there's a lot of people that will go towards trying to create this content style and habit that will build uh, more affinity and more usage and, and will drive people to want to sign up to, to receive something that's maybe long form in, you know, whether it's two weeks down the line or six months down the line, they love you enough to, to want to give you their cherished email address and actually consume this long, longer form content. And I think that's where, uh, VR and AR actually might win out, um, over time is when you decide to put a headset on, you want to do it for a very specific reason either to escape or to consume something that very few others will actually do. And I think this is where Nick's, uh, Nick will come alive is, is actually, it takes so long to create VR content, but that's where quality comes into it. That's where quantity won't. And I think there's going to be all these different channels that people will learn from and they won't dive on every social media network that, that springs up over the next three years. They'll decide to build better content and more content, but know that it's, it's part of a, a mix. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. And one of the really, really difficult things to do, and we spoke about budgets and ability to create content earlier. And when you're in VR or AR, the complexity of creating assets, the content is, is costly, um, and very time consuming. So for example, the normal kind of VR production, for example, is like producing a video game or a short film or something like that. It's very, very labor intensive, very expensive. You're talking 50,000 upwards to create a one-off VR experience that doesn't really live on. You know, it's an experience you have, and once you've had it once, you're very unlikely to return to it unless it's significant. Um, and content creation is very, very difficult. Obviously, what kind of what we've done at Vortic is the ability to create that content to very high quality, like very easily. And that's the kind of engine. And, and I think, you know, one of the things I was thinking about when we were talking was the pitfalls of content creation. And I remember back in one of my first businesses, which was primarily based around Twitter and when Twitter first came out and building communities on Twitter and also driving blog traffic and creating a blog. And it was very, uh, centered around those two touch points to begin with. And it's very easy to get into what I call the content trap mindset, where you feel you only are your content and your content. Basically you get kind of writer's block. You feel like you've got to create meaningful content every day. You feel like you've got to do a certain volume of content and you feel like you're not doing well enough if you're not creating enough content and it is more quantity over quality and i think it's very very easy for people to start thinking about that and one of the big trends we're seeing you know especially with sustainability in mind is a move to quality 
over quantity. I just wonder whether that is going to tr translate over to, you know, marketing and our content creation. Is it is it about spending maybe more time on better quality things? And also thinking about the other thing I wanted to ask you about, Beth, was reusable content. So how can I create one thing that can be used across multiple channels in different ways to give it some uniqueness? Yeah, yeah. So I think in the kind of two parts that, that you've said there, I, I always um, will fight against when production is a metric of success. So even now, a, a lot of sort of leadership teams, they want to see X amount of blog posts per week, X amount of Instagram posts. And, and I'd argue that that should never be a metric of success because then, as you say, the teams are fatigued. They're putting out content, which is substandard, just to say that they've posted content. I'm a big believer, you know, if you don't have something good to say, don't say anything. And of, and of course, it's difficult the bigger the company to obviously you can't do radio silence because it, it looks like something's wrong. But, you know, if teams are struggling with that, it's a good idea to sort of sit down and, and that's why I quite like thematic content, you know, sitting down, coming up with ideas that can then be repurposed across lots and lots of different um, different channels. And I think also thinking, obviously this is more your, your world, Nick, but activations I think are a, a great form of content. So what one of my clients is um, a retail tech company and, and they sort of support big retail brands in coming up with content ideas using technology and, and the way those brands have adapted over even the last six months has, has been really impressive. So they used to do a lot of sort of in-store activations, but obviously footfall is really low. People are still aren't out as much. So they've adapted and they use shop windows a lot of the time now and they have screens and they have QR codes and they have, you know, still quite immersive experiences, but people can interact from outside and they can feel comfortable doing so. And that, coming up with that sort of initiative that creates content you know it used to be sort of every man and its dog now it's every man and its phone we're all content creators we're all looking for that shareable moment what can we put on our instagram so actually yes as a brand you need to be creating and, and producing content but actually there are still really clever ways to get other people on, on mass scale to be creating content for you and that should should be part of your content strategy because otherwise it is really difficult just to keep mass producing and and having new ideas i think it's about being a bit more creative and thinking about these different elements and how they work together i nodded basically nodded my head off my shoulders then uh, when you were talking i think the um the thing i'd add is now we're in a, a dual screen like we're using laptop and mobile mobile and tv tv and x ipad and y i think we're in this um world now where it isn't it shouldn't be a, a metric based on production numbers it should be something um that should be based on like obviously outputs and f like funnel metrics and stuff like that. But when you've got UGC, so when you've got user generated content in the mix, how you integrate that and reuse that and then update your content and push that out. I think that's where people just aren't being uh, savvy enough yet, like embedding uh, other people's content that's created on something that you need to talk around, but you're struggling to create that. Why not have an opinion based on what someone else has said? I know it's a little bit newsroom, so it's a little bit what some newspapers do, uh, and they create clickbait because of the headline they use. But there's all this user-generated content out there that's really high quality that businesses and, and companies and even small businesses just aren't using enough. And, yeah, it means that you have to sift through feeds and create alerts, et cetera, et cetera. But all this has been created now, so if you can create great content off someone else's content definitely do that that's why tiktok and the other platforms are working now's remix culture if you can remix what someone else is doing or a duet with them make them the hero and the, the superhero of the story do it because that's what's going to make and break a lot of companies now yeah absolutely and also find you know finding the heroes as well as this is a trend in b2b but i think we'll see it more in b2c is that it used to be that the customer was the hero and actually now it's often the employee or the CEO. It's 
people um, are interested in brands, but they're also interested in the business and it's aspirational and they want to sort of follow, follow the journey around. And I think there's a lot of smart companies that actually use their employees as a way to amplify their content, as a way to be producing more content. And obviously there's a risk with that, particularly if you're a big brand, because you, you can't really keep track of what everyone's saying and it can become quite controversial. Um, but, you know, brands have been doing this with influencers. And I think, um, again, she's received a lot of backlash lately. But uh, if you look at the Molly May um, collaboration with PLT, I think because of all the political elements around sort of fast fashion and, and the workers' wages have maybe hindered this. But I just can't help but feel what a missed opportunity to – she's taken on this role. They've produced no content about this role. You know, she puts up a photo of her in the offices – where is the content about what that role entails, what's going on behind the scenes? I think that they're, they're missing a trick there of using her to sort of amplify their content, amplify their brand. And maybe that is just because of the backlash. But I think brands should be thinking about, you know, brand ambas ambassadorship, employee ambassadorship, um, making, I would say, good content marketers make their founders famous. Um, because, again, that, that's a massive pull and, and a way to create lots of content that, that is really interesting. Do you think the, um, the oh sorry <laughs> yeah no just quickly you, the Molly May you go example in on Molly May. <laughs> the Molly May examples the the perfect use case right brand hires influencer or creator as she was you know she's she was a YouTuber before Reality Star the reality TV podcast is one of the most popular surprisingly that we that we did um, but I think that they definitely missed a trick and you know she's been she's a TV personality and she's had huge success they should be leveraging that and making making her not making her make content but create content that people will want to watch and you know have a 10 minute video on what she's working on and the process that they're doing because otherwise you're not leveraging the assets that you have to play and I'm sure Molly May wants to be over, like more creative than she is and and doing a lot more and I think this is the trap that people fall into especially with influencer and creator content is they want something that they've come up with and that they think is great as opposed to working with the content creator who knows their audience, knows what content they should put out and knows the advocates who are going to love what she puts out and creates. And I think like for every brand story, there's a content creator that just wants to partner with them or work with them or for them and create brilliant content. And it's the same now in Hollywood and, and Netflix, etc. like, the actors and producers are now the ones, the stars of the setup, and they're creating this content and supporting content that, that adds so much value to it. So I just, the, people just don't know how to utilize uh, the right content form and storytelling and games have been around since, since humans evolved from, from apes, if you believe that. Um, but it's just this um, thing that we just don't know how to leverage properly. And I think brands just are so scared and confused about what to do they just don't bring the right people in so well that's what that's what i was going to say i was going to pick up on the point of brands being scared because i think the molly may example is a really good one right if you've got a brand ambassador who then says something that isn't really in line with your brand values or the image that you want your brand to project and they come under fire and they're representing you or maybe indirectly but they're linked to your brand i i, I think there's there's this tension of losing control. And I think what we've seen with content is a lot of control, like content is often around control and positioning and everything else. And what we see coming in is, or what has come in as a trend, especially through um, the rise of um, social media, but also uh, reality TV is authenticity to a certain extent, like we uh, don't get me wrong, like we got there's the authenticity scale, right? And there's people that position themselves surrounded by Gucci and Louis Vuitton bags on their Instagram post. And you're like, Oh, my God, like, this is just plain ridiculous and not good for humanity. And then you've got people who are like, you know, almost like the Jordan Petersons of the world who their their whole positioning is about speaking the truth. And you might not like what I'm going to say, but I believe that speaking the truth is going to save the world. Like if you go for a Jordan Peterson approach, how, how do you think Beth, that brands should kind of balance that authenticity behind the scenes, you know, making 
your employees or the CEO, your super, I mean, we've all been there, right? With the CEO who's trying to get media training and they just go off the script and go rogue and all the PR, like a head in hands, like, oh my God, why are they saying this? Like, this is not what we briefed them to do. And it happens like all the time. But that is, I suppose, it's not the party line that we're looking for to deliver the right messaging, but it is authentic for who that person is. So it's just, yeah, I just really was interested in, in your views about balancing that whole scenario of too much authenticity, too much authenticity or not enough authenticity and, and things that are too, um, you know, fabricated or, or positioned so precisely that they, you know, you see right through them. Yeah, I mean, I think the the fast fashion industry is is quite a unique industry in that respect because actually, if you think about the values of a brand like PLT, they're not interested in sustainability. They're not interested in you know longevity. It is all about you know making money, and and you find that with a with a lot of them. So actually, you know Molly May and and her comments, I feel fit with the brand very well. <laughs> and obviously, she's received a backlash. So. For them pr isn't great but the trouble is they didn't think about their social purpose before that before they hired molly may and and a lot of brands don't and, and actually if you have a strong social purpose and you know what your values are and you're authentic you will live that throughout everything you do and that will define who you partner with and you know there's always an opportunity for someone to misspeak and to you know have a bit of a pr crisis but the brands who have a really strong idea of who they are and and what they're trying to do in the world they're the ones who will come up against that less. And, you know, some really good examples of brands out there, um, Oatly, Olio is another one, the food, my friend works for them. They're a food sharing app and everything they put out on TikTok is, you know, about that idea of sustainability, improving the world. But even, you know, in, internally, they if they host a party, they say to the staff, please wear something, you know, that you already have or something borrowed. Please don't, you know, feel like you have to buy a new outfit. That is living your your social purpose through and through, even even behind closed doors. And actually, I think that used to be a bit of a tick box exercise. It's actually a content strategy. If we if we want to think about it, you know, from a commercial perspective, actually that that should define your content and define who you work with, and then you should come up with come up against you know less issues if that re if you really are, as you said, Nick, authentic, and you know that that's your brand values. And is is authenticity? Which way is it going? Do you feel like it's becoming more prominent with most brands or do you think there's still this caution to being almost too authentic because how will this affect brands content strategies on an ongoing basis? Because there's a lot of legacy brands that are pretty, you know, murky paths out there. And do you think content can be a vehicle for them to redefine themselves? But how does authenticity play into that um, role of, of really repositioning a company, especially with a murky past? Yeah, it's, it's really difficult, for, for, especially for the historic brands, because, you know, often we feel like, well, it's not good enough to say that it was a different time then. But, you know, it was a different time. And um, and you only have to look, you know, brands such as Canada Goose, who um, dealt in, you know, real fur or real feathers and have tried to move away from that. And actually, the response has been really positive. But I think you never quite know what way that will go. And it is much easier if, if you're a newer brand to start off on, on the right foot. And I think that's why in particularly the companies I work with, sort of new tech startups, there's this policy of sort of radical transparency where they literally share behind the scenes and, you know, employee, employee salaries and diversity and all of those kind of things. But yeah, that's much easier if you're a brand that's a year old. If, if you've got a legacy, then it's, it's very difficult. And I think that will be a, a struggle for brands go, going forward. So should we, uh, should we dive into the future state? We've talked a lot about the past and the present and the, the near future. Should we, should we jump into the future state of, of content, where it is, where it's get, like, where we think it's going to go? Yeah, sounds good. Let's do it. So Beth, what, do you want what's, to your, uh, what's your predictions? <laughs> what, my mints have the ideas. <laughs> I can, yeah, no, I can yeah. go first no. if you like. 
Um, but usually Danny steals all my ideas, so it might have yeah. a piece of those as well. Yeah. Know? I mean, I think we've touched on quite a few of the things which I think are going to be predominant over the next year. So that idea of sort of longer form content, trying to get people to spend time with your brand, whether that's through audio, video, there's a, there's a few different ways you can do that. But I think brands should definitely be thinking about, um, you know, more longer term and longer form content. Um, I also do think, I hate to say it because it's a bit of a buzzword, but I think content automation will be a big thing over, over the next year or so, particularly in SEO. There's a lot of tools coming out now. There's, there's one that's fairly new called Growth Bar SEO, and it's powered by OpenAI. And basically you put in your content brief and it sort of writes the content for you. And, and you know what? It's pretty good. Um, so I think a lot of companies looking to scale really quickly will be looking to pull on new tech automation. Um, I get asked a lot now about uh, programmatic SEO, which still feels very new, um, but can work really well. I've seen it used a lot in especially sort of e-commerce, travel industry. So I think because content is so labor intensive, companies who think about automation and, and pulling on some of those tools, but not taking it too far, I think they will um, win out. In terms of formats, I think ed education, as we mentioned earlier, is, is gonna be a big content uh, format that people should be looking into, but also thinking about how you do that. A lot of people like sort of self-serve learning now, they like things to be interactive. So how does that play out in terms of your content formats? What um, interactive experiences are you creating? You know, can you give tools or calculators that people can use to, to enable their own education? I won't go into some of the others because I think you might cover them as well. But yeah, what, what's your predictions, Danny, for the future of content? Nick, do you want to go first? Because you always complain I steal yours. <laughs> but Beth, that was, they, they were, I was completely agree with all of those. Beth, Beth stole like four of mine or something. Uh. So yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I think we're going to see, um, and this kind of touches a little bit of what Beth was saying, but I think we're going to see more tools for content creation, especially in the AR, VR space, like digitizing assets and how we can use 3D assets in, in what we do. And I think that a lot of the content platforms are going to move to ha to support 3D assets like a little bit more. So we're going to start seeing the, the ability to, um, I mean, there's some, there's some great tools out there already, but they're a bit more niche and they're a bit more behind the scenes, uh, like Sketchfab and things where people wouldn't have necessarily used before, but to platforms to house 3D assets, to interact with 3D assets. And I think that's where content can get a lot more interactive, a lot more interesting. I think um, back on one of the points that, that Beth mentioned during uh, the show, I think experiential ways of creating content. So I think, how do you put on and the shift back to the physical? How do we do things in the physical world? film behind the scenes or get UGC from the activation and how do we reuse that across our channels? I think companies need to start thinking more about physical and not be so obsessed with digital. Digital just amplifies, but how do we create the content in the first place and thinking more broadly about those opportunities, especially if it's in a retail setting um, or in store and how can you drive moments? How can you drive footfall that makes these moments go a bit more viral? So is there a drop in store that goes live at a certain time? And, you know, you can film the creation process of the drop. You can film it going live in store. You can get UGC from the people that attend. Another thing that a lot of businesses are going to look to is, and they're already doing this, but I think they're doing it more by going out and getting influencers. But I think they'll businesses companies will take a fresher, they need to take a fresher look at content and their approach to content. I think actually, Beth, you're very well positioned to help out a lot of businesses in this area because you're living and breathing it and seeing such a variety of content. Um, a lot of the time we have this tunnel vision in a brand and we get so wrapped up in what we already have and how we do things internally. I think it needs a lot of brands having fresh eyes like yourself to start really exploring content opportunities and what they're doing, doing content audits and really understanding what's going well, what's not, and how can we diversify? How can we do some, some new things? Um, and I think also um, another trend that we're going to see is, is people taking content on as a really big part of internal strategy. Yes, we already service our channels, um, but actually making content central to the organization 
and and what that means for me is a shift in how you approach content planning i think internally businesses have got to change how they approach content planning and you've got to almost have content planning meetings on on a regular basis which are multi-stakeholder they're not just the marketing team there's content like we touched on today to be found in lots of different areas and i think you've got to engage the whole company in content creation and you've got to encourage a a culture whereby people can come with those ideas and they're not no idea is a bad idea and we hear about all ideas and, and we can experiment and we can look at what what to do but instead of just content meetings being siloed and and just a marketing team thing i think more inclusivity across a business more acceptance of wider ideas and welcoming of wider ideas and then obviously having this rich kind of backlog of of idea library that you can then go and, and play around with and implement so i think there that's some things we're going to see start to change so over to danny and hopefully you've got none left but i'm sure you will <laughs> i've got a few uh but i completely agree on every every uh one that's been brought up so far um i think experiences is one that we, we raised but you know i use disney as an example disney used to make or do make significant amounts of money or most of their money through the theme parks and the content is just a way to drive money through the theme parks. I think there's brands that are going to have to take that approach and they're going to have to be really smart at creating content that drives theme park style um, experiences. So I think experiences is one that people are going to think around a lot. And I love the example of shop windows, QR codes, etc. that you brought up earlier, Beth. I think the, the creator editor role is often one or two people. I think some businesses it will become one role and other businesses it will become everyone's role. And I think um, there'll be the content creators, there'll be the content curators, and then there'll be the editors that will come out and, and try and make them the best as, as possible. So I think there are going to be ways that that will blend and mix with each other. But I think the everyone as a creator will be, will be a, a bigger trend and a, a theme that people everyone will want to be part of but it'll just be the, the the quality will rise to the top um, and the quantity will, will drop there's this real trend around live streams and live streaming and selling live streams i think that will come and go relatively quickly but i think what will actually happen is there'll be live debates and live duets and remixing that happens that'd be far more entertaining and i think with tiktok going onto tv which i think is a genius move for them and as an app I think we're going to see far more um, sort of live streams that happen that are far more entertaining and you go to it like a TV channel as opposed to an app. But I think that's one of the most important things that we're forgetting is the TV has so many inputs into it that a TV, you know, like I have an Apple TV, a Switch, etc., all plugged into mine and Sky. But, you know, like why isn't there something else you plug in that makes it just a, a device that, adds in more and more live channels, basically. I think there will be a move towards CCTV style content. Some brands will go over the top and some companies will go over the top and stream 24 hours a day just to be ultra transparent and, you know, fully, fully committed to their cause. So I think there will be some brave brands that do that. Uh, I said this before, but I'll say it again, people are falling into trapping, creating content, not art. And I think we're going to see a movement towards people creating art again, not content. And I think NFTs is a prime example of that. People are just trying to sell digital versions of, of stuff as opposed to art. And I think the NFT smart contracts in the background is something that a lot of people will look at, but like ticketing around it, um, you know, being able to put events on behind it and, and pushing out to an audience that are really interested takes art into another dimension and reduces the, the stress of feeds because the next bank that gets released might just flop because it's just another card in a content feed and that's not you know the way that it's, it's supposed to be so i think there's that and then i think a lot of internal content is going to be made external so a lot of companies are doing this where they share the email the internal email that they sent around so it doesn't leak but i think there's going to be a lot of internal content that's made external because it is just really interesting and voy it's voyeurism, it's social media, it's just content driven. And just lastly, we're in a world which is search versus discovery versus paywall. 
and um, search is always going to be around because Google makes too much money from it and, and a lot of other companies do. I think there's a lot of companies, like social media companies, that rely on you to spend hours on discovery. But we ha have seen trends towards paywalls, as in like individual creators, companies, etc. And I think journalism's going to have to continue to go behind paywalls. And I think certain creators that build an audience will go behind it. A lot of creators will try and do pay-per-view or, you know, pay-per-read or, or flip to or subscription. And I think over the next couple of years, we'll see a saturation point with subscriptions and paywalls. But I think paywalls is going to be something that is a necessary evil to to move away from giving out too much of your time, effort and, and love into social media and search engines when you don't get any reward from it. And I think a lot of brands actually might do that as well. Or well, I predict they will. Whether they will or not, it's a big, big shift, but they're my, my few. Really good ones. And there's a lot where I'm like, oh, there's a podcast in that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Topic wise, they're great. Um, yeah, there's certainly some interesting things, I think, that all begin to shape this space. And, you know, we didn't even get into uh, the whole TV side of things with Disney and everything else and how they create content. So, yeah, maybe we'll do a follow up in six months time and uh, see where we are with everything, see if some of those come true um, and point to some industry examples. But, Beth, it's been a pleasure having you on today. I think having your insight as a real you know, subject expert, the main expert in this field, working on content with lots of businesses all the time. It's been great to hear your thoughts and, and see where you think the, the industry is heading. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Certainly a lot of uh, food for thought for me as well. Always good to uh, have new ideas and discussions about this, um, especially when I'm in it all the time. It's nice to take a step back and actually, uh, you know, sort of analyse what, what's happening. So thanks for having me. Beth, where's, where should people look you up? What's the best channels, websites, etc.? Where Where can they hire you from? Yeah, so my main website is builtbycontent.com um, and you can, you know, get to my newsletters or my social media. Most active really on Instagram, which is where my sort of community is. I share a lot of education there and a lot of tips and try to demystify SEO and some of the more technical content areas. Don't use LinkedIn as much, but uh, like everyone probably needs to get better at that. <laughs> Perfect. One of my New Year's resolutions, get better at LinkedIn. Yeah. Thanks so much for today. Uh, thanks for listening, everyone. If you want to subscribe to the, the newsletter that supports the podcast, if you go to thefuturestate.co.uk, definitely check out Beth's Instagram. She's done a lot on uh, SEO for, for January. And uh, Nick and I will be back with, with more interesting episodes and different guests.